the array. Okay, we are in uh, Genesis 16, <clears throat> and we are moving on to verse uh, 4 through 6. So I will read that. And if you remember the setup that we had from verses 1 through 3, um, <clears throat> Sarah had come up with this great idea. Y'all remember that? Do you remember the time you did? <laughs> came up with a great idea and it wasn't the Lord, anybody? <laughs> okay, uh, so, um, of course, the, the goal has been to bring forth the seed. The desire has been to bring forth the seed. And I believe that her heart was right in that she, um, Sarah wanted, you know, th thought maybe this was the way to do it. <clears throat> and so she offered Hagar um, thinking that if she has the child, then she's doing it sort of as a surrogate, and it represents it represents Sarah, which also shows that there were some wrong motives in that. Um, and so uh, we pick that up in verse four, and we'll read four through six. And speaking of Abraham, and he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Okay, so the mistress here is Sarah. Um, and uh, this is um, Hagar being this way. And Sarah said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. So you see, that explains that. It was uh, talking about <clears throat> um, hey, uh, Hagar being the one who, you know, whatever. Um, my wrong be upon thee, I have given my maid into thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee, but Abraham said, Abram said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. Okay, so uh, the, first, <clears throat> the first thing is that uh, uh, Hagar conceives. She conceives right off. I mean, it makes it sound like it was like the first time or something. It's just really quick. And so, um, uh, obviously, that's going to have an effect on Sarah, right? Because Sarah has been waiting 10 years and trusting the Lord and been with her husband in this plan and this deal. And, um, you know, uh, you could say that it's unfair. Okay, but I want to tell you. God isn't always trying to be fair. Much of the time, he can find out what we're made of when the situation is unfair. And he uses those times to either bring forth his son in us or to show that we need the son brought forth in us. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> so um, uh, let's see. So I wrote, what effect... Uh, will this have on Sarah and Hagar's relationship, okay? Uh, until this point, Hagar was thought of as a means to bring forth the seed that God had promised. There probably wasn't much friction between the two ladies at that time. One was a slave and the other was a master. So before this incident, before um, Ishmael is conceived, um, I'm sure that Hagar uh, acted like a servant, because she was. And um, I'm sure that if she was, uh, for some reason, when I was writing this and thinking about it, I was picturing uh, Sarah sitting down and there being a mirror and Hagar is working on her hair and they're talking, like women talk, you know. And, um, <clears throat> And so there was, uh, I'm sure there wasn't a whole lot of friction going on there, and we certainly don't have any record of it in the scriptures. But now, um, this good idea that Sarah had seems like a bad idea. Okay? 
um, mainly because of her personal issues. If you can I put it like that, her personal issues. Okay, um, and um, so she, uh, so Hagar is acting uppity. I think I used that in my words here, and I used it today. Uppity, up, not low, but up coming higher, not taking the lower seat, not being with the Lord where he's at as uh, in his spirit as Lamb of God, but um, all of a sudden, you know, your status has changed. Therefore, people view you differently. Therefore, there might be new privileges. Maybe, I would say, obviously, there's going to be new pampering. Oh, she's pregnant. And, uh, of course, she just conceived. It's not like she's, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not like she's out to here. But she's, you know, she's feeling pretty good about herself. And Sarah gets upset. Okay, so, so that's the setting. And the rest of this story, pretty much we won't get immediately into it, but the rest of this story is going to surprise you. It's going to surprise you. Not, not the basic story that you read, but what it's really saying <clears throat> and what are the real issues. Because God's, God's issue isn't trying to convert Hagar. He's not. He's trying to deal with Sarah and trying to deal with Abraham. Abram. Okay. So, um, uh, there are uh, but the thing that immediately changes the standing of each is when one is labeled fertile and the other one is labeled barren. Now she had been, you know, all along Sarah had been labeled barren from, the, from, from chapter 11 when this whole thing starts. You don't even know Abram. You don't know Sarah. They're just names being presented there. But um, in those first beginning verses which is just talking about who's coming and who isn't and this and that, and it's just naming names and getting us familiar. It says, but, uh, but Sarah was barren. Right on. Okay. All right. So in this whole family, in this whole family, God goes to Abram and says, you're going to bring forth seed and implying that it would be through Sarah. He chose the barren one. We always think the barren one is unchosen. Come on. We look at that and we say, well, you, you just don't have what it takes to bring forth the seed of God. You know, we look at that you know, we see this and we see that and whatever. And I, I tell you what, we are blind to the realities of God if we're going to look at things in the natural. We have to say, Father, open my eyes to your view of things or we're going to judge after the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, that's evil because you've messed up and you, you don't think the way that I do or whatever, you know. We would say you don't think the way the Lord does, but clearly you don't either. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, it's true. And so <clears throat> we have to be, you know, I, I, put, I use this word, we have to be confronted with these things. Um, some people, some cultures, oh, don't ever confront anything. We wouldn't want to make someone feel uncomfortable. There are a lot of culture, cultures that are that way. Much of Latin America is that way. You don't want to say anything that, that you know, uh, you, you may disagree with them, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't tell them that. And that's, that's tough on Texans because <laughs> we shoot straight, you know what I mean? Just tell it like it is and hit me with your best shot and let's move on, you know? <clears throat> so, um, uh, so there's this um, status change and, of course, don't you, don't you think that if God, uh, if, if, let's go all the way back to where they got Hagar when there was a famine in the land 
in the land of promise, in the land that God brought them to, and there comes a famine in the land, and they go down into Egypt, okay? And then down there, Abram starts lying about his wife and stuff, and the, the, the Pharaoh gets, he's thinking, you know, I still can't figure out why this girl was a, a babe at 70 or whatever she was, or 80, you know. I mean, maybe she was. Deb is, but I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> Go ahead and say it. I'm not 70. I'm, here's what she said. I'm 67 and a half. And I'm going, you know, when you're young, you, you add that on. When you're older, you take that away. <laughs> you kind of, well, I'm... I'm actually 66 and a half or something. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, then the, the Pharaoh wants to take her into his harem, and so then he gives a dowry to uh, Abram or Sarah, and <clears throat> then he finds out it's her sister, and he's he's sort of, has integrity, and he says, of course, it's not real integrity. It's God going, uh, that's not, <laughs> you can't touch that woman. You know what I mean? We go, well, God told me that I couldn't do this, and I have such integrity. You were going to do it if he didn't intervene. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't have integrity. You got, you got the voice of God. At least you got that. You know, but give the right person the glory. You know, well, I'm really, no, I'm not. He I give him all the glory. <laughs> so, and these are things, you know, these are things of a relationship with God, with the, with the Father and with the Son and with the Holy Spirit. They're things of relating with him where, you know, I mean, if you had a friend that did everything and then <clears throat> you went around telling everybody that you're doing it and you're that person when you're just going by what this person's saying, you know, no. Well, we're, let's don't do that with the Lord either. Let's just say, you know what? I can do nothing except I abide in him. That's what the scriptures say. And just give the glory to God and say, you know, some of y'all may not remember this. <laughs> I shouldn't go off on these little stories, but I, you know, uh, uh, some of you know this story, but I'm, Every time after my shower, I get a Q-tip and I clean my ears. And uh, the basket, trash basket, is over there by the toilet. And, of course, I go like this. And, you know, I got real good at hitting that basket. I mean, real good. So good that I, I would think about it at times and go, you know, that's really good. As if it was my claim to fame, okay? I'm going to stand before God and say, you know what? With a Q-tip, I could hit that basket every time. <laughs> Does this count for anything? <laughs> you know, but I was feeling da 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 da. Well, here's what I did after I started realizing how stupid that was is that I just, you know, if I hit it, I gave God the glory, and if I missed it, it was me. I didn't, I didn't, you know, you could say, well, maybe you got even better. No, I don't want to get better. I want it to be the Lord. You say, that's really dumb. When I was recently in another state ministering, and this story got brought up, one of the main leaders came up to me and I said, I thank God for that little story that you told. He said, you have no clue how that affected me in certain areas of my life. It's, it doesn't matter if you're throwing Q-tips or whatever. Just get out of the, sh the show. You know what I mean? Just give, give the glory to God and move on. All right, so um, all right. Before it was always known that Sarah was barren, but the law of contrast was not pointing out differences. Are y'all familiar with the law of contrast? The law of contrast is that it will show you. You'll God will bring in a contrast, or by a contrast, you'll see like the nature of Jesus as opposed to you. The law of contrast is a powerful, powerful tool if you have an open heart. 
It's so powerful. I can't even tell you how powerful it is. Because you, you're reading the scriptures and you see a contrast of, of him to you. And you go, you know, Lord, I, I want you. I want that. You see, see, you see it working in someone else instead of going, you know, well, I'm jealous. Or I, you know, or, you know, this kind of stuff. Going through all that. You, you, the law of contrast is it working. Let it work the right way. And instead of making you jealous, like we have in our story here, let it drive you to the Lord. Let it drive you to the Lord. Don't don't get down on yourself, you know. Don't beat yourself or don't uh, start, you know, going off in dark places. Just say, Lord, I want you, Holy Spirit. Jesus said you were, I've done this, and y'all know it, I've, Holy Spirit, Jesus said that you were sent to show me all truth and to reveal Christ. And so I need you to kick that in real good because I need the Lord. And some of you remember this. Back then, when I was in Bible school, when, that, when I started doing that, I, I at a certain juncture, I stopped and I said, well, what if I'm asking all this selfishly? What if I'm asking, Holy Spirit, you move, I need Jesus. But what if deep down I had motives of being something or knowing something or being highly respected like Hagar stepped into, you know? And you're going to carry that and everything. And so, so I stopped because I realized that could be a factor. And I said, Lord, I don't, I don't want, you know, to have these wrong motives. So what do I do, you know? Because I'm asking the Holy Spirit to reveal Christ in me, but probably with wrong motives. And he said, keep going. Because when he's revealed, you won't have those motives anymore. <laughs> it was that simple. I went, well, all right. <laughs> Instead of wrestling down my motives, I'm going for the Lord. And I want the Holy Spirit to do his job. If he does his job, he's going to reveal Christ. He will increase and I will decrease. Amen? All right. Um, <clears throat> before it was always known that Sarah was barren, but the law of contrast was, not pointing, uh, uh, was now pointing out differences. Hagar was not even in the equation, much less any thought of her being labeled as fertile before she get before she conceived she wasn't in the equation at all now she's the, a big issue huge oh this is horrible and, oh it's it's wrecking the family and all this kind of stuff and you know only because god decided i'm going to bring in the law of contrast and now there's new labels Labels that there, there was only one label with the, with no contrast. It's not so bad, you know. You're an idiot, but there's no other idiots around. <laughs> Me, I feel pretty good, you know. Or, but a smart person come in, you go, hey, I, I used to run this place. You know, what are they doing? Who do they think they are? I'm the top idiot. Uh, but with it, we see that Hagar becomes uppity. There it is, uppity. Did you use that word up north, up in Virginia? Uppity. I like that word. Uppity for the first time. Hagar's uppity for the first time. Sarah has wrong reactions also. Okay? All right. So, <clears throat> now we can't, we don't seem to be able to believe this, but God can move in this way. God can, you know, God can, you know, if Sarah says, uh, you know, uh, I'm thinking about, you know, inside of her, I'm thinking about maybe Hagar and this whole thing, and God doesn't go, don't do that. So she does it, and then she's going, you know, this is, this is bad for me now. This is bad for me. And then all the other thoughts. I mean, what is he going to think? Now he's going to have a, a son. It's going to be the promised seed. And I'm going to be on the outside looking in. 
all this stuff, does any of this stuff go in any of your minds ever? I'm leaving. I'm not, I'm not hanging out with people like y'all. You say, how does he know all these things? Because I've been that way. <laughs> I didn't learn it on a mountaintop with God speaking to me. I learned it down in the valley with me messing up. <clears throat> um, unless the lamb comes into the situation by one of them, there will be no glory to God. And I wrote this sentence. I wonder who will eventually lay down their life. Did you say God? We shall see. We shall see. All right. So <clears throat> my subtitle here is multiple reactions. Multiple reactions. Oh, man, is this earth life or what? Multiple reactions. People reacting to this, and then someone reacting to their reacting, and then, you know, it's called social media. <laughs> this surprise result of Hagar conceiving so quickly is viewed as unfair by Sarah. Unfair, you know? Y'all, some of y'all remember, we don't go to the snot fair. It's not fair. <laughs> we don't go to that fair. We never attend the snot fair. Um, it's unfair by Sarah, who has no control over her own body to produce what was required of God. All right, that's just as true of you and me today. We have no control over our own spirit or life or whatever to produce the seed that God wants. We don't have it. It's not in us, you know? And God will wait, you know, as long as you have hope, he'll wait long enough like he did with this couple until it's absolutely, you know, you're 100 years old and there's no way you can conceive. As it says in Romans, they were as good as dead. Her womb was as good as dead. He was as good as dead. And then when it happens, you go, by golly, that was God. <laughs> that was the Lord. <clears throat> because you know you didn't do it. You know, and you can't, won't take any credit for it. Okay, so some of you, you're wondering, why is it taking so long? Man, you got like 80 more years before he's ready to do it. <laughs> not, not really, but I'm, I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, it's not instant. You know, we're so used to instant everything, you know. But it's not instant. You have to be faithful to the end. You have to, you have to keep going and say, I, I know you're trusting the Lord. Your trust can't be in you. I'm trusting you. I mean, after a certain amount of time, you'll learn not to trust in yourself. You'll go, I'm an idiot. I can't do this. Why do I keep acting like I can? Lord, you do it. Again, you don't go, I'm an idiot. I can't do this. Why should I even try? Bye. You go, Lord by your spirit. And, you know, one of the things I also said regularly, and you, my, many of you have heard, but I, would, I remember praying and saying, Lord, I, I so desire your son above myself. And it just hit me like lightning. He wants that more than I do. That was a big deal to me. It really was a big deal. I mean, of course, I mean, it hit me, you know. He wants this more than me. So he's not going to quit till he gets his son. So that, you know, that means your trust is in him, not in yourself. You see all the things going on that are contrary to that or whatever. 
we, we talked about it last night. You reckon yourself dead. You understand that you are um, identified in what? The cross. You're identified in the cross. You're identified as dead. That's your new identity. And then Jesus is not your new identity. He's your life. I mean, I could go a few places that I'm, I'm being sweet tonight. All right, so, um, so when Hagar conceives, the fertile one acts with disrespect toward the barren one. That's so common that I can't even tell you. The fertile one acts you know, with disrespect or disregard for the barren one. As if, as if you got gained anything that wasn't from the Lord. Didn't Paul say that? As if you gained anything that didn't come from his hand. So, you know, um, you know, when I first entered into Bible school, uh, this is a little different portion of, of something. Um, <clears throat> they were talking about laying down your life. They were talking about being a dying seed so that the life, the fruit would come forth. And and I was I wrestled with it, and then then I was told that the well, I heard the leader say. And all of you are going to become missionaries because we're going to send you like, the, like a seed sower thrown into all the earth. And uh, so all of you will be missionaries. And I went, oh, thank God. I'm not going to be a missionary. They're all called to be missionaries, but I'm not. I'm going to be a great evangelist. No, I put that word great in front of them. I really did. I, I was, and I was serious. I'm not going to be a missionary. Um, God didn't lead me that way. Anybody know what happened when I graduated? <laughs> I was a missionary. This is it's the way the way the Lord works. So, you know, so watch what you say. <laughs> and um, but it was it was you know sometime later I realized that they all weren't becoming missionaries in their heart. They were becoming dying seeds. They were becoming, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, you abide alone. But if it die, you bring forth much fruit. And I realized, oh, my Lord, what a great thing that is. You know, that's, that's great. I'm calling that great now. Falling into the ground and dying. I'm calling that great instead of being a great evangelist. I am so glad God intervened in my life. Sent the elders to me when we graduated, came straight up to me, Deb wasn't even there, and said, you know, now that you've graduated and when you and Deb get married, we want to send you as missionaries. And I'm going, I, I wasn't thinking, no, I'm supposed to be a, an evangelist. I'm thinking, I can't do it. I don't know. I'm not ready. You know, I'm, this is this is crazy that you're even asking this. You know, she is, but I'm not ready. <laughs> I mean, you just feel inadequate, is what I mean. Though you just feel like, you know, <clears throat> and um, and then you know, they said, "Well, pray about it." So I said, "Well, thank God, they let me pray about it," meaning. I could probably get out of this. <laughs> so I prayed about it, and the Lord said, yeah, this is what I have for you. I thank God. I thank God. From those early days when I walked into the Bible school to the time I left, it wasn't a change of identity, folks. It was another life. And, it, and it's, you know, we, we have that life when we're born again, but we're, we have ideas and 
stuff, right? And you would not have told me at any juncture early on that, look, these ideas that you're thinking are really contrary to, to literally the nature of God. And you don't want to do that. I would go, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. I, this is the Lord. I'm following the Lord. Well, I was following the, you know, Lord Satan. <laughs> Sorry. Lord Vader. <clears throat> anyway. Um, so, um, so Hagar is the fertile one, and she's uh, disrespecting the barren one. And so Sarah's response is that she reacts back with a negative attitude. Why? Why does she, why does Sarah react back with a bad attitude? Anybody, I would be willing to hear from you. She's, because she's barren, because to lift herself back up above Hagar. She wanted what the Lord said. Anybody else? Didn't want to admit to admit her mistake. Yes. It certainly didn't work the way she was thinking it would work. Anybody else? Okay. You don't want me to call names? Is that what you're saying? Okay. Um, uh, she does so. She 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 thinks this is unfair because she feels totally justified to feel that way. Come on, think about it. Dig in. Dig in. <clears throat> Dig into the Lord's heart. Find out what's going on. We get into situations that are genuinely unfair, right? Anybody ever been in an unfair situation? Yeah, and so we react to that because it is unfair. This situation is unfair. It's not, it's not a fake unfair. It's a real one. <laughs> it's a real one. And she's reacting because she feels totally justified in doing so. Okay, next question. Is she totally justified in doing so? Okay, not in the Lord, she's not. In the natural, if you're not born again or whatever, yeah, you know, go online and spread how bad this person is and talk about how unfair it is and how wrong this is and, you know, thank God I got a Twitter account. <clears throat> you know? Um, but to God, this is, this is meant to, to show her where she's at in relationship to the Lord because maybe she's been looking at Abram and where he was and not realizing that maybe she's not as lined up with him as she thinks. Maybe not. So um, she feels totally justified to do so. After all, she has lost her public status. <sighs> so sad. It's hard to read on. <laughs> she has lost her public status and is being lorded over by a lowly slave girl. <laughs> this Ain't right. Excuse my Texan. This is this is so wrong. You know. Why did God give me this particular slave girl? Right? Why why this? Why that? 
this shouldn't have been gone this way, and this would have worked out perfect if she hadn't had the attitude, and this is that, and not, and not, oh, God, what am I going to do? He's going, well, you're already doing it. You're going to do what you're going to do. That's what you choose to do. All right. Well, this is early on in the story. We'll see how everything goes. We'll stay the course. We'll find out what's going on. Yes. Back me up, Lord. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is there anything fair about that? that she's being lorded over by a lowly slave girl? The result is that Sarah becomes much more harsh in her attitudes and her dealings with Hagar. But remember, in the Lord, unfair is not the main issue. What is unfair, the issue, what is the rest of that? The issue, the issue is, the issue is not the issue. I mean, I really expected just a loud rising of the voices who've been here all this time to know exactly how that one would play out. The issue is not the issue. <clears throat> now, that's hard to share and somebody grab that and say, yeah, he said it and he probably got it from the Lord and Lord, is that true? And work it in me. We'll, you know, we'll go, we'll say, okay, well, that's probably right. And then go out and then have an issue and then we'll, the issue will be the issue. But the Lord is trying to put something in you. I mean, it's, it's like a seed. If it's a baseball, I'd throw it so hard into you. <laughs> the issue is not, not with God. The issue is not the issue. You've made the issue the issue. The issue is what are you going to do with the lamb? The other, the other seed got it, Isaac, walking up the hill to lay down on an altar and die. Here's the wood and here's the fire, but Father, where is the lamb? That's the question. Where is the lamb? Is he in you? Well, he needs to be in somebody else because I can't handle this. Well... <clears throat> People will respond the way that they are. When you're caught off guard, you will respond the way that you are, okay? But it's not done. I mean, it's done in Christ, and it's settled there, but it's not done in you. So it's, not, it's never enough to say it's done in Christ. I can do this anyway. I can, I can react this way. We have to say... It's done in him, and I'm in him as a branch, not just I'm in him. I am in him, and I choose to abide in him, so the life flows in me. Say, I'm going to abide in him, so the life comes, not just say I'm in, in there. You know, I, I told some of you how when I was a, a missionary and how I learned how to graft in a, a branch into a, another tree and um, pretty simple process and the Jamaican was doing some grafting and I walked by and he wasn't a Christian they're in our church he's just doing some grafting I walked by and saw what he was doing I'm you know kind of finally I just walked over and I said I said what are you doing he said I'm grafting this in he I said I thought so can you show me how how it works and he said, sure. Except he said, sure, man. <laughs> Me can do it, you know. And so he, he, um, he, he, cut, he takes out his knife and he cuts a branch out of a tree that is not producing good fruit. Uh, for whatever reason, I don't fully understand that part. He takes a knife and he cuts a cross into that tree that he's going to put it in. And he peels back the bark, because it's an apple tree, I think it was an apple tree, could have been an orange, probably an orange tree, that's what it was. Peels back the bark like this, 
and he takes that branch and he works it into that thing and he gets it in there and closes that back up where it's holding it and then he takes some wrap, some clear, we call it saran, saran wrap, is that what? Yeah, I don't know what to call it now. And they wrapped it around there and he tied it up <coughs> and uh, I said, well, how long is this gonna take? And he said, oh, man, it'll be a while. The thing takes a while, man. You can't do it in a day. That's the truth, man. So I said, okay. I don't know that he said all that. I don't remember what he said. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I, don't I just get so such a, a few times that I can speak patois that I have to, you know, <laughs> that I have to use it when I can. Use it or I'll lose it. <clears throat> anyway. So I kept coming back every day and looking because I knew that he would take the wrap off. He wasn't always standing at the tree like, come by every day and I'll be right here. <clears throat> I knew that, you know, he would, he would tend everything else, but he would take that wrap off and it would have caught. And so I'm going by every day. And, and the reason why I was going by every day is that we, we had to, we had a water thing down at the bottom of the hill and the, the, water main would run up into our tank and then we would have to go down and turn the water on to pump it up into another tank that we had up here. <coughs> and to do that in Jamaica, you have to take a machete and cut your way down and you cut all the way back making the path because it'll grow back within a few days because the, especially in the rainy season. <coughs> so I was passing this tree all the time. Thank you. And one day I looked and it was, the, the wrap was off of it. Of course, I want to go over and examine it, you know, and I'm looking at it, I'm seeing how it looks, and, you know, and I'm going, I, I'm, I'm, I give it a little, you know, like this to see if it's gonna go plop, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know, that's, y'all know me. So I'm just doing all that stuff, and I'm going, this thing's pretty solid. It's abiding. It's holding on in there. He's holding on to it with the flaps of the bark, and it's holding on on the inside, like tentacles or whatever, connecting with the life flow so it could come into it, you know? And my Lord, that's okay. You know, we can stick it in there, wrap it, and say, well, I'm, a, I'm abiding. Well, you, with the wrap on there, you can't do anything but abide. But the question is, he said, I and you, uh, you and me and I and you. He didn't just say you and me. He said you and me and I and you. Amen. All right. So we're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about more of Jesus when it comes to abiding so that his life can flow into us. That's what we're talking about. You say, well, if I'm, if I'm in him, does that count? Yeah, you're. You're saved, and if that's all you want, then, you know, go run joyfully through the mall and tell everybody you're saved, you know. I'm saved, I'm saved. And watch everybody go, oh, I really want Jesus like you've got him. <laughs> <laughs> or go lay down your life, become a dying seed, amen? <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the result is that Sarah becomes much more harsh in her attitude and in her dealings with Hagar. Okay, so, so that's found in, uh, when I read, and uh, let's see, it's in verse 6. And when Sarah dealt hardly, well, let's go back. Um, um, <clears throat> my wrong be upon thee, I, that's verse 5, I have given my maid into thy bosom, and when she saw uh, that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. Wait a minute, how did this become me and you? <laughs> but never mind. Okay. <laughs> Can you tell I've dealt with this before? <laughs> but never mind, let's move on into this. Uh, but Abram said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. Okay? So the Lord does that to us. The Lord does that to us. All right, if that's if you're going to go with that, then you do what pleases you. And what, what pleased her 
is to deal hardly with her, and she fled from her face. That's what, that's what pleased her. That's the good pleasure of Sarah. Okay? Uh, we'll, we'll deal with that word uh, hardly um, later, but it isn't just a, a little extra, you know, on what she was doing. Uh, I don't want to say yet. <clears throat> All right, so uh, yeah, let me finish this part then. From Sarah's point of view, she's caught up in the circumstances and questions that swirl around the situation. <clears throat> okay, the, the circumstances and questions that swirl. Where is it swirling at? Above her head? No, in her head and in her emotions. She's a swirly girl. <laughs> She's definitely a sort of girl because it's all this stuff, all these questions, all these circumstances, all this stuff. <clears throat> and so she's just going with, not with the Lord. She's, she's dealing with um, Hagar because this was unfair and you were unfair and look what I gave to you and this is your response and um, uh, all of these things. I mean, you know, you can, you can find a million things attached to that that justify you deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until you are what that word hardly means. And it's not good, folks. It's not good. She had been faithful. In this, now we're talking about Sarah. She had been faithfully waiting, agonizing to have a son for 10 years. It is unfair that this foreign girl conceives a child right off. Right? I mean, right? I mean, as far as it's unfair? Yeah, it is. See, this is, this is where the problem lies. We can hear a story like this and not feel all the unfairness of it. It's just a, it's just a story. Wait till you get in the situation. And it will be unfair because God will make sure that it is as unfair as it can be. And there will be no doubt that it's unfair. Because he's not trying to torture you. He's not trying to make life hard for you. He's not trying to, to um, um, scare you. He wants his son. And he put him in you not so, he, you know, he'd just be hidden away. Put a bushel over it. That's the way Jesus put it. You know, let your light so shine. Don't put a bushel over it. King James. <clears throat> so all of those things are coming out. Foreign girl. Uh, that's what I mean. There's a, there's a ton of things. This and there's this and there's this and there's this. And, you know, until the Holy Spirit is able to deal with that swirl, um, we're going to be who we are. We will, we will do what we do. We will do what we do. And, and that will break some of our hearts because we don't want to do what we do. Right? It will break our heart because we don't want to do what we do, but we will until we, we realize that the swirl or, or the, all of the reasons that this is unfair and I've been wrong comes to you that the issue is not the issue. And when that comes, I'm telling you, I mean, maybe, maybe not my words, maybe he'll give you some other words. That, those are the words he gave me. <clears throat> I mean, he talks to me like a father. He, he said, the issue is not the issue. You're making the issue the issue. He said, I'm not, you know, the Lord said, I'm not involved in that issue. That's y'all's deal. I'm living in a whole nother realm. I come from a different place than you do. 
said, if you want to continue to dwell there, that's your deal. I love you. You're saved. <clears throat> I'll bless you. I'll give you direction in your earth life. But if you want me, if you really want me, then you will have to come to the day when no matter what comes up, the issue is not the issue. And you go, you step back out of it and you say, Lord, you said the issue is not the issue. Now I need to hear from you. Now I want to be with you. My immediate, I can feel these old things, but I'm, I'm coming to you now, you know. I'm coming to you. And I'm calling out and I'm crying out and I'm wanting, I'm wanting you and I'm not wanting me. I know what I'll do, right? Yeah. I know what I'll do. I'm so predictable. <laughs> I know what I will, I would do. <clears throat> and then finally, this just this little part here. It's, I, I wrote down. This brings up a, a question: What can be read into what this says about God's view of Sarah? Our minds may speculate, but patience is required to understand. <clears throat> This, these things could say many things about Sarah that we think that God thinks that he doesn't think. His ways are not our ways, but we believe that they are. His thoughts are not our thoughts, but we, we, we believe that, um, you know, I can do this and he thinks it's okay. Okay, well, his thoughts are not our thoughts. I mean... It's like, well, what do I do with that? I'm not God. Well, how about this? Well, what are your thoughts on the matter? Father, how, how do you see this? I mean, he may not speak right away, honestly, because he's so used to not being talked to <laughs> in a real way. You know, well, we all oh, Lord, you know, <laughs> but that's always the earth. Oh, Lord, down here. Unfair, you know. <clears throat> and he's just going, you know. But we step back and we say, okay, you said in your word, your thoughts are not our thoughts. And your ways are not our ways. And my thought is to do something this way, right? But I'm asking you, what your ways and your thoughts are. You may have to wait. You may have to have a little patience, you know. You may have to. You may have to say, I really want to know. You don't just go, well, if you're not talking, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> you don't walk out on God. You, you just wait. You may leave, but you say, Lord, I'm holding this. What did Mary do when she, when God said, you're going to bring forth the seed of Christ out of you, the promised seed that those guys were just a shadow of? She pondered those things in her heart because they were not our ways, not our thoughts. She pondered them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what your spirit is doing, what your heart toward us is doing, that you are not leaving us what we were. You're not giving up on us. You're not abandoning us. You are drawing us if we could receive it, if we could understand it, if we could see that the things that are being shared are not attacks on us but they are your heart, your heart, not wanting to leave us where we are, but to bring us into more fullness, to be filled full, to be fulfilled and filled full of you. So we ask, we don't add please right now because we're asking something that you want to do already. We didn't come up with the concept and try to talk you into it. We have discovered what it is in your heart, and we're going after it. 
So we don't say, please, we just say, you will do it, and we ask you to. More and more. He must increase, and I must, and I'm with you in that, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Kelly's got a class coming up here.